Do you know how to protect yourself from getting blood-borne diseases? Do you know what potential diseases you may face if you come in contact with someone's blood or body fluids? Would you know what to do if somebody at your workplace got cut and blood was on the floor? The goal of the Pro Bloodborne course is to help you know how to answer these questions and give you the knowledge and skills necessary to prevent you from getting a disease from bloodborne pathogens. This course is intended for people who need OSHA compliant bloodborne pathogens and infection control training. According to the OSHA 29 CFR 1910.1030 standard, it is part of their job requirement because they may face occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens and infectious disease. People who need this certification include healthcare providers, daycare providers, home care workers, teachers, tattoo artists, and general workplace employees. The Pro Bloodborne Training Course follows the OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard 29 CFR 1910.1030 and is required at the time of initial assignment to task where occupational exposure may take place. Annual training for all employees shall be provided within one year of their previous training. Employers shall provide additional training when changes such as modifications of tasks or procedures or institution of new tasks or procedures affect the employee's occupational exposure. The additional training may be limited to addressing the new exposure created. Pro Bloodborne includes the following bloodborne pathogens and infection control training. We cover basic terms related to bloodborne pathogens, how bloodborne pathogens and infectious diseases are spread, healthcare professionals' responsibilities to avoid spreading bloodborne pathogens and infectious diseases, HIV and AIDS, hepatitis B, C, and how to reduce risks of exposure along with engineering controls, work practice to protect yourself, personal protective equipment, safe injection practices, skin diseases, exposure control plans, proper cleanup and decontamination procedures, hazardous disposal, and then the procedure to follow up if you are exposed to bloodborne pathogens through an incident. An opportunity for interactive questions and answers is available with pro trainings via email, chat, and phone support. So you might be asking yourself, how are bloodborne pathogens and infectious diseases spread? Well, first let's look at what a bloodborne pathogen is. It's a microorganism such as a virus that are present in human blood and can cause disease in humans. These pathogens include, but aren't limited to, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and human immunodeficiency virus, otherwise known as HIV. Infectious disease is a disease that enters into the body through various routes that is caused by microorganisms such as bacteria, fungus, or a virus. And infectious diseases can range from mild to even life-threatening. For disease to be spread, it requires several conditions to be present that we call the chain of infection there must be an adequate number of pathogens or disease-causing organisms. There should be a reservoir or a source that allows the pathogen to survive and multiply. In other words, blood itself. A mode of transmission from the source to the host, an entrance then through which the pathogen may enter the host, and lastly, the host has to be susceptible. In other words, they don't have an immunity to that virus or bacteria. Infection control strategies serve to prevent disease transmission by interrupting one or more links in that chain of infection. The primary source of potential bloodborne pathogens is blood and specific body fluids, like semen and vaginal secretions. Other bodily fluids may contain bloodborne pathogens, especially those visibly contaminated with blood, such as cerebral spinal fluid, which is usually found around the brain, synovial fluid, most often found around joints pleural fluid, which lines the lungs, amniotic fluid that is in the uterus, pericardial fluid, which is around the heart, and peritoneal fluid, which is around the abdomen. Urine, feces, saliva, and some other body fluids do not typically carry blood-borne pathogens, but when introduced with blood, also become potentially infectious materials. However, it can be difficult to identify a body fluid or know for sure whether or not it is contaminated with blood. And in general, you should treat all body fluids as potentially contaminated with blood 
with the potential for carrying a bloodborne pathogen's disease. So if we could be sure that we could always keep the bloodborne pathogen outside of our body, we really would never have to worry about this. But unfortunately, there's many routes that do introduce that disease into us. And the four basic modes are what we're going to discuss now. The first one is direct contact. This occurs when microorganisms are transferred from one infected person directly into another person. Examples of this would include a caregiver who has an open, uncovered wound and blood from a patient contacts the caregiver's wound. Parenteral exposure is this that comes in infected blood and then is introduced directly into your body through like a, a piercing wound, like a, maybe a needle stick or some type of sharp, jagged glass that has blood on it or metal and then jabs into your body. Indirect contact involves the transfer of an infectious agent through a contaminated object or person. An example would be a caregiver that doesn't wash his hands in between caring for someone with infected body fluids and other patients. Or a person picks up a blood-covered material with his bare hands while cleaning. And then airborne transmission, which occurs when droplets or small particles that contain an infectious agent then and are remain effective over time and distance in the air, like tuberculosis, for instance. That's a very common disease that's spread this way. Bloodborne pathogens are not typically spread in this manner. You might be wondering what the most common way that bloodborne pathogens are spread. And it's most commonly spread through sexual contact. That's the primary mode of transmission for bloodborne pathogens. The highest potential risk while providing medical or first aid care exists when a contaminated sharp object cuts or punctures the skin. A parenteral exposure is what that's called. Now examples would include like a needle stick, injection from drug usage, a cut from broken glass or metal, or human bites. A medium potential risk exists when an infected body fluid gets into an open cut or a mucous membrane, such as in the eyes, mouths, ears, or nose. The lowest potential risk is when a contaminated object touches inflamed skin, like acne or skin abrasions. In addition to knowing how bloodborne pathogens are spread, it's just as important to know how bloodborne pathogens are not spread. Intact skin is our first line of defense against disease, and bloodborne pathogens cannot soak through normal intact skin. The Centers for Disease Control, or the CDC, states that there is no known risk from exposure to intact skin. Unlike some infectious diseases, bloodborne pathogens are not spread by casual contact such as handshaking, hugging, doorknobs, or using the same equipment, like toilets or water fountains. Now let's take a little closer look at HIV and AIDS. HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, attacks the body's ability to protect itself against disease, which is the autoimmune system. HIV eventually will progress to AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, on average within about 10 years of HIV infection. This time varies greatly from person to person and can depend a lot on many factors, including a person's health status, the behaviors of that individual, and then medications that are being taken. Since 1996, the introduction of powerful antiretroviral therapies has changed the natural progression of HIV infection to the development of AIDS. Did you know that approximately 1.1 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV infection? It is estimated that over 18% do not even know they have HIV because they've not been tested and they don't have any symptoms. Approximately 50,000 people become infected with HIV every year, and about 15,000 people die every year in the USA from AIDS. Of the estimated 50,000 HIV infections diagnosed in 2011, among all adults and adolescents, approximately 62% were attributed to male-to-male -male sexual contact. An additional 3% of diagnosed infections were attributed to male-to-male -male sexual contact in injection of drugs. An estimated 18% of all diagnosed infections were attributed to heterosexual contact for females and 10% for males. 
an estimated 5% of all diagnosed infections were attributed to injection drug use for males and 3% for females. You see, less than 1% of diagnosed infections were attributed to other transmission categories. This less than 1% includes babies born to infected mothers, blood transfusions, hemophilia, sources such as needle sticks, and sources that weren't identified. To put the numbers in perspective of what causes the spread of HIV in the United States, out of the estimated total of 50,000 people each year that become infected with HIV, over 30,896 are attributed to male-to-male -male sexual contact, and 1,423 are attributed to male-to-male -male sexual contact in injection drug use. 13,800 HIV infections are attributed to heterosexual contact, and 3,800 infections are related to injection drug use. 51 of those cases are related to other. So you might be saying, after hearing all of those numbers and statistics, what does this all mean to me? And the good news is, what we should really see is that by using good work practice controls and using personal protective equipment, ordinary occupational exposures are really the minority when it comes to why people get infected with blood-borne pathogens. The majority of the reasons people do are from behaviors that are controllable. So use your personal protective equipment and your work practice controls, and you can be fairly confident that you'll be safe and sound for you and your patients. HIV is a deadly virus that causes AIDS, and symptoms are unreliable and may or may not be present. A person can be infected with HIV or AIDS for many years and not even know it. Only a blood test can determine the infection. If symptoms were present, they might include fever, fatigue, night sweats, weight loss, rash, and dry cough. The HIV virus is fragile and dies within a few seconds outside the body when it's exposed to the air. The amount of HIV present in the body fluid and the conditions will determine how long that virus lives. HIV is primarily spread by sexual contact with an infected person or by sharing needles and or syringes. Babies could become infected before or during birth or through breastfeeding, but only a fraction of less than 1% of the people contract the virus from providing medical care. And that small number is mostly from needle sticks. HIV is not spread by casual contact, like handshaking, hugging, doorknobs, or using the same equipment like toilets or water fountains. There is no vaccine yet, and there is no cure. Now let's look at hepatitis B virus. It reproduces in the liver, causing inflammation and even possibly cirrhosis, liver failure, and then liver cancer. When first infected, a person can develop an acute infection, which can range in severity from a very mild illness with few or no symptoms to a serious condition requiring hospitalization. Acute hepatitis B, which means sudden onset and short term, refers to the first six months after someone is exposed to the hepatitis B virus. Now, some people are able to fight the infection and clear the virus. 90% or more of adults and older children who contract hepatitis B are likely to clear the virus from their systems within a few months and develop a full immunity. About 10% become what we call chronic or long-term, and the virus stays in the blood, infecting liver cells, damaging them over time, and causing illness such as cirrhosis, liver failure, or liver cancer. Infants and young children are most at risk from chronic infections complications, and death. Further, in most children, the virus is a silent killer. It destroys the liver or introduces liver cancer, liver failure, or cirrhosis, often over a period of 20 years or more. It's estimated that up to 1.2 million people in the U.S. have chronic hepatitis B virus infection, and about 38,000 people per year become infected with HBV. Each year, about 3,000 people die as a result of liver disease caused by HBV. Infections have significantly decreased since 1990 because of routine hepatitis B virus vaccination. Symptoms are unreliable and may or may not be present. 
Only a blood test can determine the infection. But if you do see symptoms, they could include yellow skin, otherwise known as jaundice, yellowing eyes, tiredness, loss of appetite, nausea, dark urine, joint pain, abdominal discomfort, and fever. Hepatitis B is unique in that it's a hundred times easier to catch than HIV. This is because the virus is very small compared to HIV. Also, hepatitis B virus can live outside of body for at least seven days, and even much longer in the right conditions. Hepatitis B virus is primarily spread by sexual contact with an infected person, sharing needles and or syringes. It can also be spread from an infected mother to her baby during birth, or from contact with blood and body fluids through breaks in the skin, such as bites, cuts, or sores. People who are chronically infected can spread hepatitis B virus to others, even if they don't look or feel sick. However, like HIV, it's not spread by casual contact like handshakes, hugging, doorknobs, or using the same equipment, toilets, water fountains, etc. Unlike HIV or hepatitis C, there is a vaccine for hepatitis B. It's usually given in three doses over a six-month period. Hepatitis B vaccine is made from non-infectious material and cannot cause HBV infection. It's a safe vaccine where severe problems or allergic reactions are still rare. HBV vaccine is 80 to 95% effective in providing protection from hepatitis B when the complete series of three doses of vaccine are administered. It's wise to have an immunity confirmed through antibody testing between one and two months after the vaccine. Booster doses of hepatitis B vaccine are not recommended at this time. The HBV vaccine must be offered free to employees who face occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Employees who do not want the vaccine must complete a vaccine declination form. Occupationally exposed employees include those who administer first aid, provide medical aid to students, assist in bathroom care, work in medical or dental offices, perform custodial duties involving the cleaning and decontaminating of surfaces that may be contaminated with blood or other potentially infectious materials, handle regulated medical waste, or in general, any people with jobs that expose them to human blood or other body fluids must be offered the hepatitis B vaccine free of charge. Hepatitis C virus reproduces in the liver causing inflammation and possibly cirrhosis, liver failure, or liver cancer, much like hepatitis B virus. However, HCV is different with its own traits. A person may be infected and have no signs or symptoms and can live with the virus for decades without even knowing it, while the virus does damage to the liver. About 80% of the people exposed develop a chronic infection. Remember, that means long-term. Only about 20% are able to clear the virus by naturally building immunities. There are about 3.2 million people in the USA infected with hepatitis C virus, with about 17,000 new cases each year. Deaths from chronic disease each year total approximately 12,000 people. Symptoms are not a reliable way to detect hepatitis C either. A blood test is usually needed. And if symptoms appear, they may look the same as hepatitis B, which again would include the yellow skin, otherwise known as jaundice, yellowing eyes, tiredness, loss of appetite, nausea, dark urine, joint pain, abdominal discomfort, and fever. Unlike HIV or HBV, HCV is spread primarily through contact with the blood of an infected person through needles. Hepatitis C virus is most commonly spread by sharing needles for injecting drugs. That's currently the most common means of HCV transmission in the U.S. Receipt of, a, of donated blood or blood products and organs. Once it was a common means of transmission, but now, due to the fact that there's much more screening available, it's much less a risk. Birth to an HCV-infected mother, needle stick injuries in healthcare settings, although this is also a low percentage of how HCV infections occur, and unlike HIV and HBV, 
Hepatitis C is spread less frequently through sexual contact or sharing personal items contaminated with infectious blood, such as razors and toothbrushes. HIV-infected people face a much greater risk of HCV infection due to an already supp suppressed immune system. Now, there's no evidence of HCV transmission from food handlers, teachers, or other service providers in the absence of blood-to-blood -blood contact. But like HIV and hepatitis B, it is not spread by casual contact like handshakes, hugging, doorknobs, or using the same equipment like toilets or water fountains unless there's contaminated waste on those objects. There is no cure for hepatitis C, and today there is still no vaccination. So what can you do to reduce your risk of getting or spreading bloodborne pathogens and infectious diseases? Well, first of all, following the standard precautions. Much like universal precautions, which includes identifying blood in a few body fluids as having the potential of containing bloodborne pathogens, standard precautions means treating all blood and body fluids, not intact skin like abrasions, pimples, or open sores, and mucous membranes, like the insides of your eyes, mouth, nose, as if they could carry bloodborne pathogens and infectious disease. Standard precautions are the minimum infection prevention practices that apply to all patient care. This includes safe injection practices, safe handling of potentially contaminated equipment or surfaces in the patient environment, and respiratory or cough etiquette. The key is to eliminate the exposure to all blood bodily fluids, and other potentially infectious materials. Standard precautions includes the use of hand washing and appropriate personal protective equipment, such as gloves, gowns, masks, whenever exposure to patients' body fluids is anticipated. Wearing gloves does not eliminate the necessity for hand washing. Hand washing is the single most effective way to prevent infection. Hands should be washed before and after patient contact, Wash hands during patient care as hands become soiled. Wash your hands with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand rub immediately after removing gloves. Now remember, hand washing isn't the kind of hand washing we might do when we're in a hurry. We're talking about deliberate hand washing for at least 10 to 15 seconds. So follow your employer's exposure control plan. This is a written plan the employer must prepare to eliminate or minimize occupational exposures. Every workplace must have an easily accessible copy of its exposure control plan. The Bloodborne Pathogens Exposure Control Plan must include a determination of employee exposure by job classification, the implementation of various methods of exposure control including universal or standard precautions, engineering and work practice controls, and personal protective equipment. Not to mention information on the hepatitis B vaccination, communication of hazards to employees and training requirements, record keeping, procedures for evaluating circumstances surrounding exposure incidences, post-exposure evaluation and follow-up, and implementation methods for these elements. Anyone can write their own exposure control plan, but if you find that you need help with this, make sure to check out our website to see if our exposure control plan is just the right fit for you. You know, the fundamental method of protecting yourself against bloodborne pathogens and infection is in controlling the hazards. This can be easily accomplished by several things. Elimination. Get rid of the hazard or the hazardous tasks whenever possible. Substitution by replacing a hazard or hazardous task with safer equipment or methods. We call those work practice controls. Engineering controls, the use of devices such as self-sheathing needles and sharps containers to block or eliminate that sharp risk. Personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE, use it, know where your PPE is and how to use it properly. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, work practice controls and administrative controls, following the policies and the correct procedures in order to eliminate and reduce the risk. So now we're going to talk about work practice administrative and engineering controls. 
Work practice controls reduce the likelihood of exposure by altering the way in which a task is performed. Administrative controls include following all training, legal requirements, policies, and procedures related to infection control at your facility, while engineering controls isolate or remove the bloodborne pathogen hazards from the workplace. These include sharps, disposal containers, self-sheathing needles, and safer medical devices. Engineering controls shall be examined and maintained or replaced on a regular schedule to make sure they're effective. Now let's cover some examples of work practice, administrative, and engineering controls. Make sure you don't eat, drink, smoke, apply cosmetics, handle contact lenses, or anything where there's a possibility of exposure to blood-borne pathogens. When emptying trash containers, don't use your hands to compress the trash into the bag. Instead, lift and carry the trash bag away from your body. All equipment and environmental and working surfaces need to be cleaned and decontaminated after any kind of contact with blood, body fluids, or any other potentially infectious materials. Then if you're dealing with contaminated needles and other contaminated sharps, they shall not be bent, recapped, or removed. Needles and sharps need to be immediately or as soon as possible after use be placed in some kind of appropriate sharps container until they're properly reprocessed. Warning labels should be affixed to refrigerators and freezers containing blood or other potentially infectious material and containers of regulated waste and other containers used to store, transport, or ship blood or other potentially infectious materials. These labels should be fluorescent orange or red or predominantly so with lettering and symbols in a contrasting color. Use personal protective equipment. PPE must be provided by your employer at no cost to the employee. Examples include gloves. Make sure you use them when the potential exists of touching blood, body fluids, or contaminated items. CPR shields and eye protection. Use these when patient care is likely to generate splashes or secretions of blood or body fluids. Gowns. Use these when the potential exists of contact with blood or body fluids on clothing or exposed skin. Masks and respirators. We use these to protect ourselves from potentially airborne infectious diseases. Know where your personal protective equipment is at your workplace and know what PPE is available and how to use it. Make sure first aid kits and emergency supplies include disposable gloves and CPR face shields or rescue masks. If laundering items, such as reusable gowns or scrubs, rather than disposing of them, follow your facility's specific procedures for handling laundry. General laundry procedures include wearing personal protective equipment whenever you're handling it, keeping contaminated laundry separate from other non-contaminated con laundry, Bag potentially contaminated laundry where it's used. Use leak-proof bags for wet laundry or containers. And transport it in a properly labeled or marked bag or container, especially when shipping contaminated laundry to an off-site facility. Regulated waste is liquid or semi-liquid blood or other potentially infectious materials, otherwise known as OPIM, and contaminated items that would release blood or other potentially infectious materials in a liquid or semi-liquid state if it was compressed. This also includes items that are caked with dried blood or other potentially infectious materials and are capable of flaking off or releasing those materials during handling. Make sure you dispose of any of that in a properly labeled biohazard container, either a red bag or container labeled in orange or orange-red with the biohazard symbol. Regulated waste shall be placed in containers which are closable and constructed to contain all the contents and prevent leakage of fluids during handling, storage, transport, or shipping. Sharps, such as contaminated needles, razors, and scalpel blades, need to be placed in a closable, puncture-resistant container that's leak-proof on the sides and the bottom. They need to be properly labeled or color-coded, and the containers need to be replaced routinely and never be allowed to be overfilled. Properly labeled and bundled waste needs to be handled according to your facility's disposal procedures. State and local requirements apply as well. Don't dispose of them in the normal trash. Now we're going to cover body fluid cleanup. 
And before we get started, I think it's important to realize, as you can see here, we've, we've done this kind of the this, this scene size up. We realize we've got some contaminated objects. We have a sharp object or potentially sharp object that's contaminated as well, but the difference here is that it's not disposable necessarily. So we're gonna talk about how to deal with that as well. Now we also have our biohaz container. This is a bag in this case because we don't really need to have a sharps container. We're gonna be throwing carrots in there. They're not really sharp but they're too soaked and saturated to go into the normal receptacle. And then we have extra pairs of clean gloves, plenty of towels, and then we have a disinfecting solution. If you're gonna use household bleach, it needs to be one part to 10 parts water. Or if you're making a large amount for like the floor or a bigger spill, it's gonna be a quarter cup of bleach to a gallon of water. Now, remember, other commercial disinfectants that are registered with the EPA as effective against HIV, hepatitis B, may be used, but make sure you check the label before you trust it. So as we get ready here, we're gonna make sure that we have our personal protective equipment on. If I thought that there was any risk of getting splashed, I would even have maybe a face shield or eye shield. In this case, gloves should be adequate. Now we're going to basically, we're gonna take this sharp object out of the scenario. If there's a large amount of blood on there, and there's a decent amount, I'm gonna wipe it off carefully and then place the object into the sink that's right next to me. If you didn't have a sink, you might put it into a bucket or into a container and deal with it carefully after that. Now, after that, we have this, this environment here that needs to be cleaned up. Um, these aren't contaminated, but you know, I'm not gonna risk it, so I'm just gonna throw it into the bag carefully, being careful not to cross-contaminate. I grab another, paper towel in this case, and I grab the rest. And then wipe up the bulk of the body fluid and carefully put it into the bag. As you can see, most of this is taken care of, but I did get some on my, on my hands. So remember, the glove on glove, skin on skin, we're going to go ahead and take this pair of gloves off, being careful not to snap or pop the glove and spray the contamination. Then using the skin on skin rule, I untuck that hand, contamination's on the inside, clean is on the outside. And I tuck that into the bag, being careful not to reach in and contaminate my skin. Now before I reach for my clean container, I'm gonna go ahead and don clean gloves. Now it can be kind of a pain, especially if your hands are sweaty. So be patient because if you rip them or tear them, and there's, there's loss of integrity in the glove itself, it's not gonna do anybody any good. So we need to make sure to have them on and have them be intact. If you see any rips or tears, take them off and put a new pair on. Now I have clean gloves, I can grab my clean container and spray my surface. I like to do it in a spray, that was more of a stream. Now we're gonna do it light enough that we don't contaminate or shoot contaminant all over the area. Notice, I know where the contamination was at, but I'm kind of going out in a radius that I know it's covered. Now, I set this aside, I grab another paper towel or two, and I begin wiping this up. Being sure to wipe up all of the contamination that I can visibly see. And again, because I have a sink here, I'm gonna move this into the sink where I'm gonna decontaminate that as well. This has contamination on it, I'm gonna put it into the biohaz bag. If I now go to my spray, which I'm going to, I need to take these gloves off and don one more clean pair of gloves. It's really, you know, something to, that's common sense. I mean, I grabbed a paper towel, I wiped up more contamination, the paper towel's wet, so it probably wicked the contamination towards my hands. So even if I can't visibly see it, I like to practice making sure I have clean gloves when I touch clean things. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and spray the rest of the surface. If I see any other contamination, I'll wipe it down, in this case, I didn't see any of it. So I'm gonna spray it and make sure that it's soaking wet. And then we're going to let it evaporate to dry. It needs to at least be on the contact of the contamination for no less than 10 minutes. And that's about an evaporation time. Now we have our contamination in the sink. That's when I would actually take my solutions and clean those appropriately using the same method. Making sure to be careful not to get poked 
or to get any sharps. Once our biohaz bag is filled, we go ahead and carefully seal it up and put it with our other regulated waste. Now let's take a closer look at proper glove removal. Remember that only skin touches skin and glove touches glove. And if we follow those principles throughout this step, even if you forget the exacts, it should keep you safe and protected from any kind of cross-contamination. When we're taking off the gloves and they're contaminated with either blood or other potentially infectious materials, we're going to grab close to the cuff of the first glove and pull it away from the hand. Slowly untucking and unpeeling that hand away from the other gloved hand, we wad that uh, dirty glove up into the, the palm of the gloved hand. Now following the skin on skin rule, we go underneath the first or the second glove and untuck that, which keeps the contents on the inside clean on the outside. We can now dispose of this in a regulated waste container and then move to our next step, which is as equally as important as the personal protective equipment, and that's washing our hands properly. Now let's take a closer look at hand hygiene. It's been deemed that hand hygiene is the most important infection control technique. We need to make sure we disinfect our hands whenever they're visibly dirty or contaminated and definitely before having contact with patients, putting on gloves, inserting invasive devices, manipulating any invasive device, and after having contact with a patient's skin, having contact with bodily fluids or excretions, non-intact skin, wound dressings, and contaminated items. And lastly, when we remove our gloves. Now let's look specifically at how to practice proper hand hygiene. You know, it's been found that actually alcohol-based hand rubs, whether they're a foam or a gel, kill germs more effectively and more quickly than hand washing with soap and water. They're also, when combined with an aloe or some type of skin protectant, are less damaging to the skin. It's a preferred method unless you can see visible, dirty, um, some kind of contamination on the hands. When we do this, we're going to apply the recommend, recommended amount of the alcohol gel onto the hands, and then we're going to rub it over the full surface of the hands, into the crevices, around the nail beds, the fingertips, making sure we're getting full coverage of the hands, and we're going to continue to rub these for no less than 20 seconds, but especially until it's dry. We're not going to use anything to actually dry them, we're just going to continue to rub it, get it all over the surfaces of this, the skin in any little area that you think, in between the fingers, around the thumbs, in the crevices, until it's actually air dry. Remember that we're gonna rub on the tops of the hands as well. Sometimes we can get into a habit of just doing the surface, but making sure we get into the nail beds, the cuticles, the fingertips, the surfaces of the hand on the top and the bottom all around. Now, if we see that we have um, obvious visual contamination on the hands, that's when we're going to have to move to the actual soap and running water method of cleaning our hands. So if we have contamination on our hands and it's invisible, then we need to use hand soap and running water to decontaminate with. If you have the ability to use a sink that you can activate with your foot or with a knee bar, that's obviously the best way to go, but in this case, we don't. So we're gonna turn our water on and then we're gonna wet our hands. So we're gonna go ahead and wet our hands, take off any watches or contaminated jewelry that will need to be decontaminated as well. And then if you can't take off your, like a wedding ring or another piece of jewelry, then you're just gonna clean around that and underneath it. Once our hands are thoroughly wet, we're gonna go ahead and get soap, an adequate amount in the palm of your hand, and then we begin to rub our hands. As we rub our hands, we wanna make sure that we're applying the soap to the top surfaces of our hands, around the wrists, underneath the jewelry, around the jewelry, in between the fingers, paying special attention to crevices, wrinkles, nail beds, cuticles, in between the fingers. As we wash our hands, we're gonna make sure to do this for no less than 20 seconds. And in fact, even some studies and recommendations are saying to go 40 to 60 seconds with vigorous scrubbing and washing of 
the hands and the fingernails and the beds. Once we've washed that for the recommended amount of time, we're gonna go ahead and rinse the soap off our hands. I like to watch everywhere else on my arms, making sure like with a short sleeve shirt that I, I don't have any other spackle or spray or anything else on my forearms or on my elbows or areas that I may have missed. This is also a good time to double check to make sure we didn't get any punctures from sharp objects. And then after we're done washing our hands and rinsing them per the recommendations, we're gonna move over to the hand towel. Now again, there are these different devices nowadays that are motion sensitive. And if that's the case, of course, we're not gonna touch anything that we don't have to touch. But in this case, it is lever activated. So we're gonna go ahead and get an adequate amount of paper towel. We're gonna thoroughly dry our hands and our forearms or any areas that we've washed. And then we're also going to use the same paper towel or towel to reach over and turn off the sink. And now with the paper towel, we're simply gonna turn off the faucet and then throw the hand towel away in the trash receptacle. If there's any contamination around the sink, again, that's gonna get back to more of the, uh, the work practice and the engineering controls where we should be regularly decontaminating those surfaces anyways, along with watches or other contaminated devices that need to be cleaned up as well, following the regulatory protocol. we're going to cover exposure incident and reporting. An exposure incident is defined as a specific mucous membrane, broken skin, or puncture contact with blood or other potentially infectious material that results from the performance of an employee's duties. This includes contact with blood or body fluid with an open cut, splashes of blood or body fluids into the eyes, nose, or mouth, or any situation where there's a high probability of contamination. If you think you've been exposed, decontaminate first. Report the incident to your supervisor and then seek medical treatment. An immediate confidential post-exposure medical evaluation, prophylactic treatment, which means treatment to help prevent the infection, and follow-up needs to be conducted by a physician at no expense to you, the employee. Complete the forms as soon as possible after the incident, but don't delay medical treatment to fill out paperwork. Remember, the sooner we get that prophylactic treatment, the better protected you'll be. Now remember, the only way to confirm that an exposure happened in the line of duty is to document it. And if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So make sure to complete an exposure incident report, which includes the following. A description of circumstances of how the exposure occurred, including the route of transmission, the time, date, and place it occurred, and all people involved, including the exposed person or persons, first aid providers, and identification of the source individual unless it is unfeasible or state or local law prohibits it. The source individual's blood shall be tested as soon as feasible and only after consent is obtained in order to determine hepatitis B virus and HIV infectiveness. Forms and continued follow-up action will proceed according to employer's policies and procedures. The employer's exposure control plan needs to specify who should be contacted and what procedures need to be done to follow up. Employers need to provide post-exposure prophylaxis when medically indicated, counseling, and evaluation of reported illnesses at no charge to the employee. Remember, if in your protocol it states to go to a specific clinic or an office, Make sure that that office or clinic is equipped to be able to treat you in the time frame that's necessary to protect you most.